My name's Corinne. I'm um, the uh, Director of Account Success at Engaging Networks. So um, I'm some of your main contacts for your accounts. Um, and uh, Rebecca and Glyn, of course, um, work for the, the, the Root Cause Collective, and they'll be running this session today. But obviously, a very timely um, webinar, given the, I think, shock news last week. The election is going to be very soon. So, um, yeah, hopefully this is going to be really useful for everyone. I think it's time to introduce Rebecca Turner and Glyn Thomas from Root Cause Collective. So they've put this great uh, webinar together for you about maximizing the impact of your general election actions. So I shall hand over to, to them. Thanks very much for coming. Thanks, Corin. Um, hi, everybody. Um, great to have so many of you here today for this webinar. Um, I'm not going to lie, we scheduled this webinar before the general election was called. So it is great timing. But um, we, we didn't know we didn't know any more information than any of you um, about when the general election was going to be called. Um, before we get started today, a really brief introduction to who we are. So um, Glyn and I are part of Root Cause Collective, which is a group of freelancers that work with uh, charities and not-for-profits looking to campaign and fundraise more effectively. Um, so we see ourselves as an alternative to an agency. Um, so we look to build our team of freelancers around you, depending on what size of project um, you have. And we bring together the right knowledge, skills and expertise for your project needs. Um also want to briefly hand over to Glyn to introduce We Could Even, which we kind of see as a sister organisation to Root Cause Collective. Yeah, so um, hi everyone. Yeah, together with, with Joe Derry Hall, um, we run a small digital agency called We Could Even, and we kind of focus on building additional functionality and features on top of what's already in, in engaging networks and more kind of design and, and web development work, really. Yep, so that's a bit about us. Um, we're both both Root Cause Collective and We Could Even are accredited engaging networks um, partners. So we spend a lot of time with um, lots of different organizations using engaging networks to do fantastic support and mobilization. Um, before we get started today, we wanted to ask you guys a few quick questions to do our own polling, <laughs> um, very on topic. Um, so yeah, we're gonna kick started. We've got four questions for you guys, um, if you'd like to answer them. Um, so they should be up on your screen right now, I think. So yeah, we just want to find out a little bit more about um, how your planning's going um, and what kind of things you might be planning on doing with engaging networks and what things you might be planning for your action. We did have a question that was going to be, when do you think the general election is going to be? But um, we now know the answer to that question, so we've taken that off. <laughs> Um, okay, fantastic. Let's take a look. Um, so, are you going to be campaigning before the election and after the election, or just after the election? Wow. Okay, a lot of people both before and after. Um, equally split with just after and don't know yet, and just three percent before the election. That's interesting. Now, I thought it was going to be most people campaigning just after the election. So there we go. Um, that's why polls are interesting. Um. Where are you up to with planning your general election actions? 5% <laughs> have all their planning done. So you can rest assured if you are um, in lots of meetings this week um, trying to work out what to get sorted, um, that you are, that's the majority of people. Um, I think a lot of us were not expecting a summer election. Um, so there we go. We're all in the same boat. Um, no one claiming help. <laughs> and... 38% with most planning done, 49% with some planning done, and 8% not started. Interesting. Okay. Um, if you're planning an email to target action, how many different versions of emails are you going to create for um, prospective parliamentary candidates or MPs? So 40% um, just one for everybody, 34% one to four, nobody five to 10 or more than 10, and 26% of people saying don't know. That's very interesting, Glenn. Um, we're going to talk today a bit about um, a lot of the functionality that Engaging Networks has for tailoring messages. I wonder if people choosing one to four are doing devolved nations um, you know, um, messages as well. So that's very interesting. And then finally, are you going to be adding a, a daisy change to your action? So that means um, that you ask the supporter to do something else on the thank you page of an action, which is really easy to do um, using engaging networks. Um, 
So 20% people of people saying they're going to do another campaigning action. Viewer, 17% saying a fundraising ask. 20% they're going to be trying both. That might not be consecutively, I guess. That could be one or the other at different times. 3% of people saying no. 40% not sure. Um, and did, we didn't have any other things in, suggested in the chat there. Really interesting. Well, we're going to be talking a bit about daisy chaining today as well, because we think that's an important part of maximising the impact of your um, general election action. So, yeah, without further ado, we will get started. Um, so, this isn't to pick on cat's protection whatsoever. It's just um, I imagine that a lot of your engaging actions might have a closed page that looks like this about now, because, as I said earlier, um, when we organised this webinar, we did not think the general election would have been called, but it has been. Um, Rishi Sunak did manage to pull off a surprise for most of us. Um, and so also looking at those polling questions and seeing the state of people's planning, um, I imagine um, you are in a state of uh, maybe just beginning to launch things. I have seen a few actions go out, but taking stock, working out what your next steps are quickly um, to um, move into your campaigning phase for the general election. Um, so today, what we're going to do is chat you through the three top types of actions you might be considering for your general election campaigning. And these probably won't come as a surprise. Um, petitions or open letters, emails to target, surveys or quizzes um, and we're going to consider we're going to share some tips for how we think you can optimize them we're going to go a little bit beyond um, some of the you know basic best practice rules as we know lots of you are very familiar with that and engaging networks lets you build um, pages that are already particularly well optimized um, and we're also going to share some advice on how we think you could make them more impactful using some of um, the tools that Engaging Networks offered, some, maybe some of the ones that maybe you've overlooked in the past but could be making good use of now as we move into this uh, general election campaigning period. Um, before we get started looking at those actions, I thought it might be good just to take a step back and think about the context of this election and um, suggest so some observations from us on why this election might feel a little bit different to the ones we have been through in recent memory. Um, so first of all, I mean, as you'll have seen from the Labour campaign going out, but also from, from the Tories, the Conservative Party as well, change is the election buzzword. But I think that was the buzzword before um, the election was called. Looking at what pundits and pollsters are saying, consistently it seems broadly across the polling that they're doing, the public are saying that they want change. And that seems very unlikely to change substantially as a national narrative. But I think what's interesting to unpack there is that change isn't necessarily a positive thing for everybody. Some people, it's just a case of we're really tired of this. We just want someone else to have a go. And um, so it's not change. It's not change in the sense of we want a big radical change. We just want someone else to take the wheel and to keep things going on. And um, so I think how your um, campaigning narrative fits within that is going to be um, something you really need to consider. Um, and which you'll know I talked about um, for those of you that came to the workshop that I did at the Engaging Networks conference. Um, very obvious to say, given the polling, but we are likely to see a changing of the guard. I was reading an article last week which talked about the fact that we've obviously had five prime ministers in eight years, but crucially only three changes of government from one party to another in the past half century. So whatever your political views, however different or not, you think what the what Labour and the Conservatives are offering um, personally or, or for what that means for your charity, Still, the fact that we will likely see a change from one party to another is a massive change um, and it is going to have a really big impact for our work, which I know might seem like stating the obvious, but I think it's still important to keep in mind um, as we look forward to, to this election period. Um, and what that also means is we're really likely to be seeing and definitely going to be seeing a big changeover in the MPs. So you'll have seen, um, obviously, probably if you've been following the news, the number of people uh, saying they're going to stand down, both in Labour and um, the Conservative parties and other parties. So there's over 100 MPs standing down. Um, and of course, many more may not be re-elected. So we are looking at having to build lots of new uh, relationships with people who have never been MPs before. Um, and that um, presents massive opportunities and also some challenges which we can explore 
um, a bit today about how you can use uh, how you build your and strategize your actions and engaging networks to best build those new relationships. All right, so let's get started at looking at these actions. We're going to kick off with um, a petition or open letter. So this is generally an action that has a target, um, which you can build um, pretty quickly in engaging networks. So why might you do one as part of your general election campaigning? I've already seen lots out there that people are doing towards um, party to political leaders in particular. Um, but one of the reasons you might consider it is it's relatively straightforward to set up which might sound very simple, but if you have been caught a bit on the back foot with how soon the election's been called, um, maybe your policy team aren't quite there with the information that they need, maybe doing an email to target action, particularly to PPCs, feels like it's going to be too much of a stretch to turn around in the next week to 10 days, um, then thinking about maybe just focusing on after the election and a open letter or petition to maybe a key minister or the prime minister once they get into power might be a better use of time um, and more strategic. Um, so this is why I think even though they can seem like a very straightforward action, it could be a good place to put all your eggs right now um, and just focus on that after, after the general election. Um, the other reason I think people are looking at them right now is that they're a really effective recruitment tool, which I know we talk about a lot. Um, but as they are a low, low barrier um, entry, you know, easy for people to do. Um, as people, you know, as our issues, depending on what issues we campaign on, are more in the press right now, this can be a time to be getting in front of people and recruiting them um, and petitions and open letters. Consistently, we find with organizations we work with are one of the most cost effective ways to recruit new supporters. And they're also really useful as a low bar entry point to other actions. So looking at lots of you considering daisy chaining, if you are struggling to get people to take email to target actions, then perhaps putting it after a open letter or petition action could be a great way of getting more people to engage on some of those higher bar actions. So how to optimize it. So here are some things we commonly see people miss um, with optimizing these types of actions. Um, so the first of all is sometimes lots of people just create the same version of the action for all their different audiences. Um, and what can be better to do is to think about um, different versions for different audiences. So um, what we often recommend is maybe for new supporters and existing, existing supporters, you use more or less content. If you're sending your existing supporters to the action from an email where they've already got all the information, then you don't need a page with loads of info on it. Um, you can just send them to a, a page where it's really easy to scroll, find the, find the form, sign the action. If you're promoting this on Facebook, using paid ads, you might want a page with a bit more context because they're just coming from a small ad with a couple of sentences and they might want some more information. So you can easily duplicate the action, create a one with more, um, more content for them. That said, you also want to think about desktop users and mobile and tablet users with sh shorter and longer content as well. And Engaging Networks has this great tool built into text blocks that you can add to your action, which means you can add a mobile version. Um, and often I see this being missed and what this means is that if someone is clicking through from your email on a mobile, they don't have to um, scroll really far to go and find that form and take the action. You can create a shorter version of text that sits at the top or wherever it is in your page um, so that people don't have to scroll. So always make sure you're creating those mobile versions of text blocks and getting your editing hat on, editing it down to make it shorter. Uh, next step on optimizing is maximizing your opt-in rates. If you are looking to recruit new supporters in this next six weeks so that you can have a real impact um, and a real voice when those new MPs are finally elected, opt-in rates are going to be crucial. Um, so first of all, think about removing or hiding your opt-in question for existing supporters. So the last thing you want to be doing is promoting your action to existing supporters and then choosing no and you're losing them as supporters through that support. Um, and again, you can create different pages for different audiences. So you could just create a version of the page that doesn't have the opt-in for them. Um, using a yes-no radio for your opt-in and adding a warning message if, some, if someone selects no. Um, so yes-no radios have always proven to be one of the best um, performing ways of having a format of an opt-in question. Um, so here's an example here from the Lexi mission of if I select no, it's like, are you sure? Um, and this can really work to minimize or improve um, your opt-in rate. Even just a few percentage, percentage points can have a real difference here. 
Um, and then finally, using redirect and filter. So this is um, functionality when you build an open, a petition page and engaging networks comes up down the side. Um, and it means that what you can do is if people choose not to opt in, you can send them to a thank you page that asks them to reconsider and has that opt in question again. And times where um, we've used this, I've seen opt in rates improve for actions of anywhere between five and 11%. So again, a really um, great way of, of boosting that opt in rate. Does mean you can't necessarily put that daisy chain ask of the extra campaign action or maybe a fundraising ask, um, but it does mean you recruit those those people that haven't opted in, you have that other chance, extra chance to, add, um, to ask them. And then how to make it more impactful. Um, so moving beyond just thinking about conversion rates and opt-in rates and things like that. Um, how can you make sure these actions really have impact? Um, so one thing to think about is using local data to make a national issue more relevant. And um, so this is an example from Action for Children, which you may have seen uh, the team from Action for, uh, for Children present this at the Engaging Networks conference if you were there a few weeks ago. Glyn, I will hand over to you to chat to, about this because you actually helped build this, build this with them. Yeah, so just to mention really, really quickly on this, um, kind of this is an example about kind of using data to tell a story about people's local area and then to use that to motivate them uh, to take action. So I'm just going to move on to the next slide here. And so the idea is that it's um, it's using uh, the reference data functionality in engaging networks, which is something we're going to talk about more in a bit more detail in a minute when we look at the email to target actions. But um, when you've got local information about your issue, that's whether it's broken down by local authority area or, or parliamentary constituency, you can upload that data into engaging networks. And, and in this specific case with Action for Children, instead of being included, say, in an email to, uh, to the target, this reference data is then shown, shown on the page using a range of different visualizations and, and imagery and using that data to help the support and make a, sort of a, an emotional connection with the, with the issue and encouraging them to take action um, that way. And um, another example of that um, here as well is from um, YMCA where um, they're encouraging people to sign an open letter um, and, and using, using that kind of same functionality or similar kind of functionality of entering your postcode first and then having a bit of, bit of data about your local area, some information specifically about your local area before moving on to to, in this case, signing an open letter. Back yeah. to Rebecca. <laughs> it's a really great way to um, localize a national issue um, and make it more engaging um, for, for the busy snake then. Um, so the other thing, uh, the other tip we have for making your actions more impactful is to really be strategic and think carefully when choosing your messenger. So the other thing we really like about this action from YMCA is it, the letter is from Emily. Um, and as you can see on the, the screen there, Emily is just one of many young, young people whose mental health nearly took her future from her. Now she is using her story to campaign for change to get the investment that NHS mental health services really need. Um, but yeah, it's about thinking beyond maybe just your charity being the messenger, your, char your charity chief executive being the messenger. Um, who, who do you have? Um, yeah, who, who could it be that actually is going to... Um, mobilize supporters because it's really going to connect with them that they want to sign this person's letter and also when that letter gets handed in to your target um whose story is really going to connect with them um, and make them make sure that they respond um, and connect with your issue um those of you who came to the workshop at the engaging networks conference would have seen this from me it's one of my favorite graphs i know there's a lot of information on here but um this is the veracity index um which is run by ipsos so every year they ask people to um, say who they generally trust to tell the truth um, and so I just think it's an interesting reflection of who your messengers could be obviously it depends on the, what, ch what charity you are and, and, and what issue you work on but um, you can see there at the top nurses, airplane pilots, librarians, doctors, engineers, teachers all very trusted by the UK public um, so if you are a health charity um, and can get a nurse or a doctor um, to be the voice and messenger of your campaign, that could be really powerful. Um, you can see politicians generally are at the very bottom of the list at 9%, which I don't think um, probably comes as too much of a surprise. But interesting to see charity chief executives there in the middle, um, trusted slightly less than pollsters, although this is the 2023 um, list. 
Now, this isn't me saying or us saying that your charity chief executive shouldn't be the messenger for things. It's just more um, interesting to consider who else might um, also have a powerful voice and a trusted voice um, when thinking about your influencing um, and campaigning. All right, and the final tip for making open letters or petitions impactful um, is adding a question to learn more about your audience. Um, so often when we're working with organizations, um, one of the things um, people can struggle with is really knowing who it is that their actions are attracting, who it is, particularly when they're recruiting people um, through these types of actions. Um, and a really simple way to start a barometer on that is just to add a survey question to your action. Now you can do this on the form, or if you're concerned that that's having an impact on your conversion rate, you can add it on the thank you page. Um, but here are two examples, one on the left from Versus Arthritis. This is actually a hand raiser, not a, not a petition. But um, what made you decide to get involved with Versus Arthritis and seeing what their connection to arthritis is with that question. And then on the right, um, an action I actually saw this week from Marie Curie, which is an election action, where they ask, have you or someone you know missed out on good end of life care or bereavement support? Yes, no, prefer not to say. Very quick, easy question to, to add there to, to learn more about your audience and who who you are mobilizing. All right, Glenn, I'm going to pass over to you to talk about email to target action. Yeah, great. So um, what we're going to look at in this next section is, um, I'm just trying to move on the slides here. There we go. Caught, took a moment to catch up there. Um, yeah, I think what we're going to be, what we're going to be looking at here is um, both thinking about email to target to uh, candidates before the election, but also then thinking about new MPs um, after the election. So just a kind of um, very quick introduction to this, kind of why why do an email to target action at this point? Um, I think um, getting, getting your issue, your specific asks, uh, a lot of charities have sort of put together a manifesto of their specific specific asks, um, getting those in front of parliamentary candidates is a key reason for doing that and getting those in front of them sent to them by their constituents. And so being able to demonstrate the amount of support for your issue, for your asks uh, within candidates, specific constituencies is very important. Um, and getting those candidates to, to try, and pledge, try and get those candidates to pledge their support for your asks uh, is very important. And then after the election, um, you know, you, using this as an opportunity of, of, of getting in touch with new MPs and building that relationship with brand new MPs. And as Rebecca said earlier, there's going to be, whatever happens, there's going to be a lot of them um, in a couple of months' time. Um, just a couple, couple of quick things to note on the kind of candidate database availability. I know a lot of people are very keen to find out about this. So um, it's not yet in your Engaging Networks accounts data is currently being collected and verified. It, it will be available and in your uh, Engaging Networks accounts uh, next week. Um, and I'm sure there'll be some more questions about that um, that we can kind of come back to at the end. But yeah, so be able to start actually using that candidate database for campaign actions uh, from next week onwards. And I've had a lot of people asking me that question. <laughs> and I'm sure Corin's had a lot more people asking him and Michael as well. Um, so yeah, so we're going to look at really two, two, really focus on two specific ways around optimizing email to target actions, uh, and that's first of all kind of looking at different messages for different targets and the and the options you've got in engaging networks for doing that, and then secondly looking at different ways that you can uh, get supporters to personalize uh, the message um, that's being sent uh, from them to to MPs, and and again making use of all the different tools that there are available within, within the software. So first of all, looking at kind of different messages uh, for different targets. And, um, you know, there, what, what the simplest way of doing this and something that we'd really recommend, especially for, for uh, there's a lot of people there who said they were thinking of just having kind of one email message that would be used for, for all, all candidates, for example, is, is to make sure you've got at least multiple different subject lines for those messages that you're using on rotation. And within within engaging networks, when you're setting up the target block to send those messages, you can immediately set uh, six different subject lines for those messages. And, and also, you know, if you're not breaking it down more than that with different messages to different targets that we'll, we'll look at in a, in, a, in a moment, you've got the option in there, which you can see here about using this message 
on rotation. So what you can do is you could create multiple different messages that are then used on rotation. So that if you have lots of supporters in a particular constituency, you're going to be contacting their candidates um, rather than every message from 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 every one of their um, every one of your supporters being identical. At least this way, you can have some variation, and so they'll see a slight variation in those messages if you're not doing any more tailoring than that. And obviously, one of the key things to bear in mind here is it, it is a lot of extra work to be generating multiple multiple subject lines, multiple versions of emails. This might be a good example for how you could use chat GPT or another AI tool to, you know, you write the first version of a message, write a subject line and ask, ask tools like that to maybe generate a, a couple of alternative versions for you, which you can then check and verify. It's probably quicker to do that than if you haven't got the capacity than to write you know, four or five different email messages and multiple different subject lines. But either way, that's, you know, we'd really recommend so that not, not every subject line and every message that's being sent to candidates is identical. Try and help make sure your messages stand out by having some variety in among those. And obviously that applies not just for, for candidates, but for, for MPs uh, subsequently as well. Um, and so when you are thinking about potentially going beyond that and having different versions of your email message that supporters uh, are sending to, to candidates or MPs. A few different ways you might think about breaking this down is whether you want a different message for candidates in England, Wales, Scotland and Northern Ireland, for example. A couple of examples of how you might set that up here. Again, when you're when you're in the target block, instead of having that use use the message on rotation, if you're using the, the functionality of adding a processing rule to this message, you can set it so that you've got a different a, a message for, that goes for candidates or MPs in England, one for Northern Ireland, one for Wales, and one for Scotland, so that you've got those slightly different messages, especially if your issue is one that where there's you've got different information about the different different um, different nations or whether you have uh, you know, a slightly different ask for candidates in those in those places. Um, another option would be to do this by party um, so that you could have um, a different message for politicians from different parties, maybe because they have something in their manifesto or some previous commitment they've made to your topic or issue and you want to reflect that in your message. Um, or it could be that um, you know, there, there's a group of M MPs, candidates that you know have previously expressed publicly some support for your issue and you really want to remind them of that or want your, your supporters in their constituency to remind them of that. That can be a really important way uh, of, of, um, of demonstrating the importance uh, of your issue. Because I think it's worth, worth remembering that there's a lot of organisations, a lot of people planning activity right now candidates are going to be getting a lot of emails. You need to do what you can to make sure yours stand out in candidates' inboxes. And, and lastly, I just wanted to mention on this, you can also, using these processing rules in the target block, specify specific contacts uh, that you might want to use to, to you know, if, if there are specific candidates and politicians, MPs that you know have, have been very vocal on your issue and have really supported it, and, before, you might want to send a very different message to those people, thanking them and, and for their previous support and really pushing them, pushing them now. So you can then use this to, to specify specific individuals um, that will get a different, a different message again from that, from that default one, which again will really help build that relationship, especially with new MPs if you're able to kind of tailor those messages. Um, and then reference data, which we sort of touched on a little bit earlier. Um, this is this can be really valuable to bring into the messages to to your um, to targets um, specific local data that you know about each uh, constituency. And so when the when the new uh, candidate uh, database is added into Engaging Networks next week, you'll also be able to um, create a new reference database um, using that uh, candidate database in Engaging Networks. So um, what you'll be able to do is then download uh, that data set um, and then you'll, be able, you'll have this sort of CSV file with the 10 columns of reference data that you'll then be able to add in that, that specific column of data, of stuff that you know about those specific constituencies that relates to your issue. 
and then bring that into the message content when you're creating the messages to different targets. And that's that can be a very nice way of, of at least bringing some real local uh, local importance to the issue uh, into that message that candidates or, or MPs are getting as well. Um, and one last thing to mention on this is also one thing you may may potentially want to do is, is from your action is is exclude candidates from specific parties. So when you're when you're when you're choosing the target database for for an email uh, to target action, um, you've got the the pencil icon next to all contacts there. If you if you click on that, um, you've got that option. Uh, there's a party tab there. You could in theory, um, you know, unselect specific parties if you if you don't want to be contacting um, candidates from specific parties in previous in previous election campaigns, then I know that some organizations have chosen to, they didn't want their supporters contacting, for example, UKIP or BMP, depending on the issue uh, and things like that. Could be something that you you need to do and want to focus on doing this time as well. Um, so then moving on to how you, the different ways you can allow supporters to personalize the message. Um, so one thing that I mean, obviously, what what one one option that, and and that some organisations do is you've got you've got one message. It's set up as an HTML kind of message in in engaging networks in the target block. There's no way of editing that. The simplest the simplest way of actually getting giving supporters the opportunity to actually edit those messages is is having a plain text message that that's going to the candidates or or MPs, and then giving supporters the option to edit um, edit that message. I think it's worth asking, uh, as I was in practice, how many how many people will do that, and and I think you know it's going to vary from organisation to organisation and topic to topic, of course. But in practice, um, probably not a huge number of people are actually going to do that. So one one thing that some organisations have done is just a really simple thing is to have one optional sort of um, text area, free text question on the first page of the action, and then. Um, bringing the, uh, um, you know, asking supporters a simple question: you know, Why is this? Why is this issue important to you? For example, and then bringing in their answer to that uh, question as a as an optional, you know, paragraph towards the end of the end of the message that goes to candidates as well. So that can be a simple way of, uh, rather than um, rather than necessarily having a completely free open text bo uh, box that may not be modified. Simple way of getting a paragraph of more personal personal story or something from your supporter. Um, another way of doing this is uh, rather than, or in addition to having that sort of free text box, is using a question such as a, a radio button or a select uh, question. And, and setting up this question um, on the, again, on the first page and to ask, uh, ask your supporters a question. And then when that, the value of that answer for each of the different responses they might give. That could be a paragraph of text that's then included in the message that goes to candidates or MPs. That, that doesn't have to be that value when you're setting up that question. That The value doesn't have to be the same as the label. The label can be, you know, related to your, um, you know, the, the versus arthritis example earlier. So someone living with versus arthritis, for example, compared with that, caring for a relative, that could change a specific paragraph of the text that goes into the email to candidates or MPs. Uh, another option is having an editable area or areas of a message. So what you could do is you could have the sort of the, the start and the end of the message to, to politicians could be could be fixed and static, but there's one section in the middle which is which is editable by by supporters. Kind of similar to having that sort of text text box uh, first option as well. Um, and then last thing to mention on this is when you're setting up the action, it, it can be quite a good idea to, to set it up so you BCC the copy of the messages sent uh, to you as well. So you can see exactly how supporters have, have customized the message uh, if it's an editable message as well. Um, and then something that a lot of organizations will do is, is create a data capture form so that uh, candidates, for example, can can pledge their support to your topic, your campaign, your issue. Um, and that can be set up as a, as a data capture form that you don't publish publicly anywhere. You only include in the emails that are going to uh, candidates or MPs. Um, 
and uh, and then so you can collect any any um, any any responses to that. I think it's really important to remember to update uh, update your action to candidates. So if they, if they do do that, uh, is to remember to do to update your campaign action so that instead those those people who've pledged their support to your to your campaign your issue. Um, they're getting a different message from supporters in future that thanks them for their support, thanks them and acknowledges that they have have pledged their support. Um, I know that in the past, in, in 2015 and in 2019, some organisations set up this, this kind of functionality and then didn't, didn't uh, change the message. And they had some complaints from, from candidates saying, why, why am I still getting messages saying, saying uh, from your supporters saying I should support your your campaign when I've already pledged to support it. So I think just bearing in mind to allow the, have the capacity to, to do that. And, and again, it's important to remember what this is building a relationship with new MPs for the long term. You want to get that off to a good good start. So remembering to to get that action updated with, with new new candidates as they are pledging their support for your campaign, I think is really important. Um, and then just a couple of extra things to think about when, I mean, obviously the, the, the things we've talked through there are, are very relevant for both candidates and uh, new MPs, I think. But there's some specific things I think we just wanted to kind of flag thinking about uh, specifically post-election. So it'll be around around a week or so. Uh, that's what Engaging Networks have told me. Anyway, uh, it'll be around uh, a week or so after the uh, election is over. Um, the new Westminster MP database will be available in your Engaging Networks accounts. And so, yeah, so it's a huge opportunity to influence a lot of new MPs that are that are new to the job there. And so, you know, something that I think is especially really important here is having different messages going to MPs and try to reflect any previous support or experience they have of your issues. Um, and a couple of links here that are potentially useful is the Local Intelligence Hub, um, which I think um, that has a lot of information about MPs that was produced by the Climate Coalition, I think, in partnership with a lot of other organisations. And then the Future Labour MPs uh, website has some useful information. And I'm sure you you, you yourselves will have knowledge of, of particular candidates and MPs who have in the past um, been very supportive or, or have lived experience of your issue. Um, and I think... You know, it's just important that, you know, again, there's going to be a lot of activity after the election, a lot of people encouraging supporters to contact their MPs. And again, um, they're going to have overflowing inboxes with a lot of a lot of um, messages. So, you know, you want to really make the most of this opportunity, be persuasive, tailor those messages as much as possible. Do, do what you can to make those messages stand out in supporters uh, sorry, in uh, new MPs inboxes, those messages from supporters, or whether those messages are coming from supporters or from yourselves, uh, from your organisation, introducing yourself to uh, to MPs. It's it's your potentially your first introduction to these new MPs, and yeah, making that first impression to them and their staff is is going to be really valuable. And I just. To finish off, just coming going back to that example from Action for Children again, it's like uh, the, the they they also created a version of of that sort of page um, with a sort of data visualization that specifically went to MPs. And actually, it, it can be worth thinking about whether you have specific information. You, you don't even necessarily have to do a kind of supporter facing action at this point when you're introducing yourself to to MPs. But if you've got got some you know story to tell, valuable information about their constituency that you want to get in front of them. It doesn't always have to be a support, supporter focused action that you're thinking of and that you can use engaging networks for and the reference data functionality for as well. You can have a sort of a, a version of pages and, and, and actions that you've got that is specifically a target audience of MPs themselves. Back to Rebecca. Then meet myself. Um, thank you, Glenn. Um, yeah, let's move on to surveys and quizzes um, before we move on to questions. So why do um, things like surveys, polls, quizzes as part of your general election campaigning? Um, well, I I get my screen to work. Um, so first of all, it's a really great way 
to learn more about your supporters during this crucial time. So what they might think about your issues, how they might like to support you, um, and to inform, help you, you know, learn more about them to inform your campaigning after the general election. Now could be a really good time to maybe survey your supporters about how they might like to engage with their new MP after they're elected, for example, and find out. Um, it could be that if your issue is one of the key election issues, it is more in the news, it's more in your supporters' minds, they're thinking about it a little bit more. They're obviously really thinking about, well, not everybody, but a lot of the public will be thinking about this moment and the fact that they have the chance to elect their new MP um, and it will be more front of mind. Um, it's also a great way to increase your supporters or your target audience's understanding of your issues, including tackling myths and misconceptions. And we know during this election campaign, um, desperate people do desperate things and there's likely to be a lot of incorrect information thrown about um, and this is your chance to um, play your role in, in doing that myth busting um, and, and fact checking and setting the record straight. Um, can be a great way to combat, combat election fatigue, um, so just a different way of presenting information about your issues and getting people to engage um, with your campaigning. Um, and equally, a great way to engage new or disengaged audiences. So if you have a, a certain segment of your supporter base that are not taking any of your general election actions, putting a quiz or a survey in front of them could be a, a way to um, draw them in and get them to, to join your campaign. Um, this is an action that I actually got last night when I was scrolling through Instagram from Refugee Action. Um, you know, politicians in the media have a lot to say about refugees um, in the UK. How much do you actually know? I think they're using the fact that obviously immigration is a is a hot topic for the general election as an opportunity to um, tackle some of those myths and misconceptions with with this great quiz. And you can see the first question there as a as a screenshot on my on my phone. Um, so just very quickly how to optimise if you are doing these. Um, so particularly with, with surveys, stay really focused on what you're trying to find out or what you want your audience to learn if you're doing a quiz. Surveys can get really big really quickly when people throw in all these things that they might like to know um, and generally means that you uh, end up asking questions that your supporters might not feel comfortable answering or aren't really sure why they're being asked um, and that can really impact your conversion rate. Think of your survey or quiz as a conversation or a pub quiz. Um, I really, really recommend reading your questions out to a colleague um, and listening to how they answer them. A lot of the issues I see when I take surveys from organisations is that the um, they're asked in a really formal, um, kind of professional way um, and not in a conversational way. And so I often find them really hard, the questions really hard to understand and to answer. So make sure you test them out and it will really help um, spot where you might have some issues and improve your conversion rates. And finally, you'll see this done a lot, I think, um, by lots of different organisations, but there's a reason for it. Put the first question of your survey or quiz in your email. Um, you can have a different, send people to a different version of the survey or quiz depending on the answer that they choose. Very easy to duplicate pages in, um, in engaging networks. Um, generally just means people are more likely to, A, start the survey or quiz in the email and then take it and, and finish it rather than just a take the survey button or take the quiz button in your emails. And then how to make them more impactful. Um, so first tip is to close your feedback loop. So tell people what you've done with the information they've shared. AGK are really excellent at this. I'm not sure if we've got anyone from AGK on the, on the webinar today, but I love your campaigning emails and your content. I think it's absolutely excellent. Um, this is an email I received um, about a month or so ago, I think, or maybe a couple of months ago on the left, which was, um, you know, wanting to get my input into the AGK campaign manifesto, manifesto, election manifesto. Really great question. Do you feel happy and secure at home? Yes. No, I do not. Really enticing. You know, I'm going to open that email and want to answer that. But even better, a few weeks later, I got a thank you email, which talks about what was done with that information and how my response to that survey has fed into um, fed into the you know the campaign and that they'll be in touch soon to tell me what what's going to happen um, um just really fantastic um way of closing that feedback loop so don't forget to do that um also remember you can keep it really simple so 
you can just do polls, which are just, I just feel is like a different format of a survey. Um, so just, it could be three quick questions. Do you agree, disagree? Um, you know, like a snap thing, just a snap um, series of questions just to get um, your supporters' views on a particular subject. You can also just do things like one question quizzes, um, which do this a lot. This is an email I got from them a couple of weeks ago. Um, those, you know, they, they're just four separate pages um, static pages that I click onto with different a different um, a different answer depending on what I've clicked. I think the answer is actually it's all of them. <laughs> um, so yeah, really really simple way to do um, a quick engagement tool um, with your with your emails. And short polls can be just as effective as an example there from Versus Arthritis on the right. Um, so it can be very quick and easy to set up and do as part of your general election campaign uh, to keep people engaged. And then finally, I don't know how many of you have heard about the six principles of influence or persuasion, um, but when it comes to surveys and quizzes, um, you can really use commitment and consistency here as one of the principles. So um, it really puts this pr principle into action. So as humans, we really like to um, stick to our commitments. So if we said we're going to do something and you go to someone and you say, oh, well, you said you'd do this, we're much more likely to do it because we want to be consistent with that fact. We want to be consistent with what we've said. We want to be consistent with our values. And we want to be consistent with what we've done in the past. Um, so this is why reflecting back to supporters, oh, you emailed your MP or your, your candidates at the last general election. Will you do this now? People are much more likely to do it. So reflect the beha uh, supporters' behaviours back to them. Um, if you run a survey and say, how would you like to engage with your MP when they're elected? and someone says, oh, I'd love to go and visit them, you can email them and say, oh, thank you for saying you would go and visit them. Would you like to receive an information pack? Reflecting all of that back, reflecting how they might have answered a, a poll um, about how, what they believe about an issue, all of those things, if you're having trouble mobilizing people, could be ways um, to boost those mobilization um, rates amongst your supporters um, just by popping them into profiles, segmenting your emails, um, using conditional content, reflecting that content back, which are all things you can do if you're using the Engaging Networks email tool. All right, one final thing. Don't forget daisy chaining. We obviously asked a question in the poll at the start, and lots of you are considering it, which is great. Um, here are just a bunch of questions that you could be asking and things you could be um, doing after some of your actions um, this general election. Don't forget fundraising. I know lots of you are considering that, but this is still a moment to test out those fundraising asks. Um, I think you could be, as I think there's some, there's some organizations they could perform really, really well during this time. Um, if someone has taken the time to email their candidates, is this a chance to ask them if they're gonna be going to their local hustings, like a little mini survey afterwards? Would you be willing to ask your candidates a question about this? Here's a list of questions to print off and stick by the door should any of your local candidates come knocking. Um, if it's an open letter, will you e now email your local candidates or your new MPs? All sorts of different things you could be asking to daisy chain those actions together to get people to take more involved actions or to build your knowledge of what your supporters would, would be willing to do. Um, so really sit down and think about that in your teams. Um, make sure it's not a rushed part of, of building your actions over the next few weeks. All right, very briefly before we move to questions, um, we know this has come on quickly. It's been a, a little bit of a surprise announcement. Um, we'd love to help you if we can. So if you need help with your general election strategy, we're offering 10 free 30 minutes of every call. So please do get in touch. Um, our email address is there and it's going to be on the next page as well. So please do drop us a line. But we'd be really happy to answer any questions anyone has in the final moments. And yeah, we hope that's been a useful rundown and refresher on what you can do um, in engaging networks to increase your impact with your general election action. That's great. Thanks so much, both of you. Some really um, useful insights and very timely um, advice, I think. So um, we've got a question from Kat, which is, um, how do we actually add a daisy chain? Um, it's a really good question. Um, so you can just have it that you set up a redirect so that when someone submits the page, they go to another page and you just make sure on that page you've said thank you for taking the action and but the form there will be maybe a donation page or the next um the next 
yeah, the next step of the next action you want them to take. Um, or you can um, put buttons on the thank you page that uh, you might have a question that says, you know, can you can you donate to help, you know, reach more people? Um, and it might be like, yes, I'd like to donate five pounds. And you hyperlink each of those buttons to a donation page instead, um, which means you will need to know how to code a, add a button into your page. Um, but I'm sure the support team can help um, if that's something um, you want want some support with. Ben, am I missing anything? Uh, no, I think that's the main thing. The only thing is uh, just to flag up so that you mentioned earlier about the redirect and filter functionality to send people to different places depending on maybe an answer to the first question. To what, if, if you've asked a question on the first page, you could send people to a different thank you page with a different ask. So if if you if you've asked a question about if someone has a specific experience of the topic, you might you might those might be the people you want to really go meet your candidates, meet your MP, go to a hustings. You could send them to a specific thank you page really focused on that. Thanks both. Yeah. And um, obviously the nice thing about the redirection, it will remember the information. So either it will pre-populate or means they don't have to enter it again, or you can send them to the second page if it's a sort of a free page action or something like that. Um, so that they don't have to enter it again. But yeah, you can obviously just set up the redirects to existing campaigns or a couple of tools, but yeah, the support team will be able to help. Um, another question on uh, daisy chains is, do you have stats about daisy chaining to make them the case internally? So how effective are they in your experience? Um, I think it depends on what type of actions you're wanting to daisy chain. If it's to make the case for fundraising, um, I mean, it's hard to benchmark, obviously, because every organization is different and has a different audience and a different ask, et cetera. But, um, you know, organizations that I've worked with have seen you know, the percentage of people that take the action and then go on to make a donation can be as many as, you know, between 10 and 20% of people for some actions. Now, obviously, that depends on how many people are taking the action in the first place. Um, but generally see very, very strong um, conversion rates for daisy chains if they're well optimized and tested, um, but can perform very, very well. Um, but I wouldn't I wouldn't say that as a broad benchmark. And if you're not hitting that, also don't worry because... Um, yeah, you know, everything, as I say, it really does depend on your organization and your issue. Jen, is there anything you'd add? No, I wouldn't end up No, nothing to add on that. Sam, if you wanted to email us directly and we can share oh. some specific stats. Um, oh, Hi. Sam. Sorry, yeah, it let me unmute, which is great. Yeah. Um, oh, sorry, added... sorry, I just discovered the tool. Yeah, sorry, Karen. <laughs> no worries. Um, I added some extra, extra info in the Q&A, but like adds a separate question, which wasn't the most useful. But specifically, um, we're thinking of putting paid behind it's not about fundraising we're thinking of putting paid behind like a hand raiser petition style action and then daisy chaining our ppc ett because um we tend to find that emails targets don't do that well with paid social but people are kind of internally kind of understandably wary about putting paid behind something that's like not our ultimate goal and so i guess if there was any information or stats about I guess like the ultimate payoff between the drop offs offs that you might get when doing something like that versus the fact that you'll have probably maybe have more people in the system and whether those things balance out behind as opposed to just like straight up putting paid behind an email to target action um was more what I meant. I hope that makes more sense. Cool. It does yeah. make sense. Lynn. Well, I, I the first thing I would say is I would say why what test it. Try doing two ads, one direct to the uh, email to target action and one to the daisy chain hand raiser with or, or petition with the email to target on the thank you page. Do a test, see which one gets the most for, for, the, for the budget. Um, um, I think it's very hard to say. It, with, I, my sense is that, um, you know, I don't have any specific stats or examples to give you, but I do know that the best way to get buy-in for trying something like that internally, it, it's very hard to not give approval to a test to find out what which is going to work best. And if you do a small amount of budget behind each of those options um, for a few days and, and, and then put the rest of your budget behind the one that's performed best. Thanks very much. Um, we're at time, but two very quick questions that hopefully we can squeeze in. Um, the first one I can probably answer is about how often is the candidate database updated? Basically, once it's released 
and uh, should be next week, early next week. It'll be updated almost every day. Um, so obviously things are going to change quite a lot. So the same database will be updated. So you can keep it on the same page and we'll just pick out the right people. Um, but we'll, yeah, as I say, we'll update everyone soon. And the, the last question we got is, um, do you have any suggestions about what to ask candidates to do once they have pledged? That's a really interesting question. Um, if anyone has has some things that they've decided they're going to do, pop them in the chat now, because I guess we can crowdsource. There's still 40 people here. We can crowdsource an answer to that right now. Um, this isn't a very, I'm not sure if it's the most helpful response, but I would say this is when you go back to your general election strategy, what is the most useful thing that they could do? I mean, to be honest, I would, given we've only got six weeks, if a, if a candidate is pledged, I think that's great. That's enough. And then it's about, do they get in? And then making sure that when they get in, that email that you send them is, thank you so much for pledging. I think I'd be focusing more on post-election. Maybe that's what you mean, actually. Um, what, what do you then ask them to do? But that's when you go back to your to your policy team, to your public affairs team. And that's when you get on with the with the real, <laughs> actually the real work. The real work is now as well. But it's once they're in power, what do you want them to be doing? Um, so is it about, will you have a meeting with us? Will you meet a people in your local area? It could be all sorts of different things but yeah any if anyone's got some ideas you can pop them in the chat now um but otherwise yeah i think that's one for you to go back to your team and and decide as part of your strategy it's great thanks everyone for coming especially um glenn and rebecca for taking the time to put all this information together do take them up on that free offer for uh for a, uh, a little surgery i think that sounds sounds really useful so um and do contact me or the support team uh, with any sort of technical questions or anything else about the product, um, we'll be very happy to to answer. So yeah, I think um, we'll we'll call it a day there. But thanks again, everyone, and um, good luck with all your campaigning. Yeah, good luck, everybody.